cautionary lesson. Um, and most of my talk is focused on this problem of getting to the roots of violent behavior to prevent this. Um, and the idea of going back to the roots um, was uh, written by Aristotle um, say, uh, when he, he wrote, he who considers things in their first growth and origin will obtain the clearest view of them. And uh, I guess most of you are developmental psychologists uh, and I think developmental psychology is the uh, approach that uh, helps us get to the roots. Um, and let me tell you just a little bit about uh, I, how I got there. Um, to a certain extent, I started too late. Uh, before going to do my PhD at the University of London, Institute of Education. Um, I was a clinician and I was working with mentally ill offenders. Most of them had killed someone and we were trying to help them rehabilitate. Uh, that was in 1970. And then uh, at the University of London for my PhD, I decided to work on juvenile delinquency. I did my thesis on the treatment of juvenile delinquents. Um, and eventually, um, as I did research on the development of juvenile delinquents, I realized uh, that we need, needed to start much earlier than adolescence. And so I started working with uh, preschool children. And finally, 20 years ago, I realized that uh, the start was not preschool children, but uh, pregnancy. Uh, so I've been working on pregnancy and I'm going to take you uh, um, through that uh, story. Now, the knowledge, the developmental knowledge on criminal behavior uh, sort, of, sort of started in the 19th century um, with a, um, <clears throat> an astronomer, a Belgian astronomer, Ketle, who uh, decided uh, that he would study human behavior. And he drew this age crime curve uh, by looking at the, uh, <clears throat> the age of prisoners. Uh, and um, with this description, he created this age crime curve, which is still uh, in good use by criminologists. Um, <clears throat> the panel on the understanding and control of violent behavior in 1993 concluded that modern psychological perspective emphasized that aggressive and violent behaviors are learned responses to frustration, that they can also be learned as instruments for achieving goals, and that the learning occurs by observing models of such behavior. Such models may be observed in the family, among peers, elsewhere in the neighborhood, through to mass media. So this is the well-known <clears throat> uh, knowledge on aggression, violent behavior. We learn it from our environment. More recently, the World Report on Violence and Health um, came to the same conclusion. The majority of young people who become violent are adolescent limited offenders who in fact show little or no evidence of high levels of aggression or other problem behaviors during their childhood. 
if we go backwards to find where this idea of learning from your environment came, well, you can find it in Jean-Jacques Rousseau in his book on education, Emile, uh, where he clearly says, God makes all things good, man meddles with them and they become evil. And uh, concerning aggression, it seems that uh, it appeared obvious to everybody that we learn this over time and it peaks somewhere during adolescence or early adulthood. Um, <clears throat> the first longitudinal study that I uh, started was at age six years of age. Um, and my thinking was that um, if we start in kindergarten and we follow children over time, we will see how they are learning to aggress. And uh, the results um, <clears throat> by age 15 of the children were very surprising to us and to many, many other people. Uh, we were assessing their levels of physical aggression every year as reported uh, by teachers and self-reports. And uh, what we could see by age 15 was that everybody was at its peak in physical aggression in kindergarten. And that in fact, there was a group that maintained a high level of physical aggression, but most other children were decreasing the frequency of their aggressions from kindergarten to adolescence. <clears throat> so if we define aggression in different ways, physical aggression, indirect aggression, and we also qualify it as being proactive or reactive in terms of, of aggression, um, what we can see from a large sample, a large population sample here in, in Canada, um, the first group is a group of uh, children who have never shown any sign of physical aggression. It's 26 26% 26 of the sample and mainly girls. The second group is 35%, uh, 63% <clears throat> um, of, uh, of that sample is uh, our girls. And they've shown some indirect aggression over time. And the, the level is relatively stable. The third group, 28% of the sample, 61% of boys are showing physical aggression decreasing over time, an increase in indirect aggression up to age 10 and then a decrease, stable proactive aggression and decreasing reactive aggression. The fourth group, 7% of the sample are showing high levels of physical aggression in kindergarten. And as you can see, decreasing over time, 59% of these children are girls. And finally, the last group, the really aggressive ones, high aggression, uh, physical, indirect, proactive, reactive from kindergarten to uh, age 13, and um, it's 5% of the sample, and we have 84% of, uh, of the boys. Now, what happens to boys who have 
chronic physical aggression from kindergarten to adolescence, well, <clears throat> over time, they fail in school, they use alcohol, tobacco, drugs, they have early sex, they're violent, they're depressed, they're unemployed, and they are poor. Now for girls, uh, less of girls have serious problems with aggression. Um, uh, but for those who have problems with aggression and often with hyperactivity, as they become adults, we see tobacco abuse, school failure, early sex, partner aggression, depression, teenage pregnancy, and welfare. These characteristics are important. Um, <clears throat> if we, as you will see, when we start to take um, an intergenerational perspective. So we can ask ourselves, what kind of mothers will uh, these girls become? And um, now if we remember <clears throat> what Mandela was saying to understand how to prevent the chronic trajectories of aggression, we must address the roots. Um, <clears throat> So since our longitudinal studies starting in kindergarten was showing that the children were at their worst uh, in kindergarten, uh, we decided to start another longitudinal study and that one started um, at birth. Uh, so we took a random sample of the population in the province of Quebec in Canada. Uh, we also um, initiated at the same time a sample of twins and we assessed them at uh, almost every year from five to sixty months of age and then uh, relatively frequently um, until they were uh, twenty years of age. The sources of information were parents, childcare providers, teachers, peers, uh, official files, observations at home, in daycare, at school, and in the laboratory. We assessed physical, emotional, cognitive, and uh, social development. Um, so what do we see when we start at birth? Uh, well, we see at least at six months of age, um, we have uh, children uh, who can start hitting each other. Uh, this is the picture of a, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the boy on the right who is hitting the little girl. Um, is uh, the grandson of one of my good friends. Um, and he sent me that picture saying, um, Richard, uh, look what my grandson is doing. Um, I think you'll be interested in this. Uh, so um, I um, have been using this picture, um, but before I, I used it, I asked the mother, uh, can I use it in my presentations? And she said, yes, uh, but at one condition. You must say that he was only defending himself. Um, so when we aggress, um, <laughs> we're always defending and, uh, ourselves. Um, and it's our mother who uh, told us.
Okay, so you, um, even if you don't speak French, you understand what is going on here. Um, it's a family where one of the child had a serious aggression problem and they accepted uh, that cameras be put in the home to see exactly what was going on. Um, and from my perspective, it's, it's one of the best examples of uh, physical aggression is not something uh, that starts in, uh, in childhood, in late childhood or, or adolescence. Um, <clears throat> so the physical aggression trajectories uh, that we have from the birth cohort uh, from one and a half years to 13 years. Um, I must say here that uh, when we started that study and I said that we would have to ask questions on aggression to parents uh, from the start, my colleagues were saying, you're crazy. They will not except that we asked them about aggression at six months or at 12 months of age. Uh, I finally managed to convince them that we, uh, we should ask the question by 18 months of age. And these are the trajectories uh, that we are getting from uh, mother ratings in early childhood, then teacher ratings and, and self-reports. And we can see that um, the peak in aggression is between two and four years of, of age in terms of frequency of aggression, and that it decreases uh, with time. Um, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> probably the reason why um, until very recently, uh, the, the idea was that aggression peaks into uh, adolescence or early adulthood is because we've been focusing on the damage that the aggression is doing. Uh, a two-year, three-year-old who is aggressing is not damaging much and um, we can even laugh about uh, the behavior he, he has, uh, but if that behavior continues over time, um, <clears throat> it's much more of a problem for, for others. Um, so it's very clear that the peak in physical aggression is in early childhood, around three and a half years of age. And <clears throat> I've looked back in the literature and it's interesting to see that St. Augustine, who created the idea of the original sin, was in fact described himself as being aggressive when he was an infant. Uh, and he had this intuition that aggression was something that was inherited. And it's from that perspective that he invented the original sin. Um, <clears throat> Jerome Kagan, a famous developmental psychologist at, um, at Harvard, um, wrote, a young child cannot be aggressive until he has some psych psychic intention of injuring another. Aggressive behavior, as we have defined it, does not occur with any frequency until well in the second year. Um, so that's been another problem with the definition of aggression is that you are aggressing if you intend to aggress, but clearly the aggression is starting before intention. So the conclusions from the longitudinal studies on early childhood to early adulthood for physical aggression is that 
humans do not learn to physically aggress. They learn not to physically aggress. Chronic physical aggression is very rarely late onset. This appears to be true for other behavior problems, such as stealing and destruction of property. Boys are more likely than girls to frequently use physical aggression and physical aggression, physically aggressive boys and girls are at high risk of numerous long-term biopsychosocial problems. Um, so I started my work from a clinical perspective. And of course, I've been preoccupied by which mechanisms prevent some children from learning to gain control over their physical aggression and which mechanisms should be targeted to prevent chronic physical aggression. And so here we get into the more modern aspects of research on aggression trying to look at genetic factors, environmental factors, environmental factors that moderate genetic effects or environmental effects on gene expression and other such questions. Um, <clears throat> although these questions may be perceived as modern when you, we use modern words, words, they were relatively clearly formulated in the past. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I, I mentioned St. Augustine. Erasmus of Rotterdam, um, in his work on education, wrote, we should especially be, we should be especially careful with our children during their first years, for at this stage, their behavior is guided by instinct more than by reason, so that they are inclined equally to good and evil, more to the latter perhaps, and it is always easier to forget good habits than to unlearn bad ones. This truth was already known to pagan philosophers and caused them great perplexity but their speculations were unable to penetrate the real cause and it was left to Christian theology to teach the truth that since Adam, the first man of the human race, a, dispos a disposition to evil has been deeply ingrained in us. So we can read it here as genetics. While this indisputably man's condition, however, we cannot deny that the greater proportion of this evil stems from corrupting relationships and misguided education, especially as they affect our early and most impressionable years. And this is obviously the environmental effects. A century later in Great Britain, Thomas Hobbes wrote, Unless you give infants everything they want, they cry and they get ang angry, they even beat their own parents. Thus, an evil man is rather like a sturdy boy or a man of childish mind. An evil is simply want of reason at an age when it normally accrues to men. By nature, genes, governed by discipline, brain, development and experience of harm, the environment. Um, Rousseau wrote in reaction to uh, Thomas Hobbes um, and his idea that we were born good and the environment uh, makes us bag, uh, spread like wildfire because we prefer to think that we it's the environment uh, that makes us bad. So uh, I'm showing these uh, to help us think that most of the work that we are doing with modern uh, tools, uh, it's, it's important 
to have a historical and a philosophical perspective on it because um, what appeared to be modern in the 1960s, 70s, when I started uh, this work, uh, to me appears whole today. Um, and what was known centuries before appears to be newer than what we were thinking in uh, the 1960s and the 1970s. Okay, so let's look at genetic factors. Uh, one of the tools that are interest, important uh, for genetics is twins. And even NASA has understood this and um, they've put twins in space to help us um, sorry, I'm getting a Black Friday advertisement here. <laughs> um, okay, so twins in space to understand the impact of space. Uh, and it, it, it was a big story last, last year um, in science. Um, so with the sample of twins that we've been following, we, we showed um, that um, physical aggression and expressive, by looking at physical aggression and expressive uh, vocabulary, uh, that there was a strong, stronger genetic effect on uh, physical aggression than on uh, expressive vocabulary. Uh, <clears throat> we also showed that genetic factors explain between 50, per, 50 and 62 percent of the variance in frequency of uh, physical aggression. I'm sorry, I'm, I still have these missing. Okay, well, I'll try to I can read. see, um, Richard, a tiny cross in the right hand of the box. I think if you click in the top right hand, yeah, click oh, okay. there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so um, we have uh, been observing that genetic effects um, change over time, uh, but there are strong genetic effects on the frequency of physical aggression. Um, and we've shown that the genetic vulnerabilities for aggression interact with friends' aggression um, to promote children's aggression. Now, uh, genes are, as we now know, are like piano keys. Um, and we need to think about epigenetics if we want to understand well uh, the genetics and the environmental effects. Um, <clears throat> in um, 2004, I was a, a member of the Canadian Institute of Advanced Research and um, <clears throat> two of my colleagues in that institute, uh, Moishe Schiff and Michael Meany, presented to us uh, the work that they had been new, uh, doing um, on uh, epigenetic programming maternal behavior uh, with, uh, with rats. And I, I still remember that most of us around the table were sort of wondering if this was really serious stuff uh, that they were showing us. Um, <clears throat> and they convinced us uh, that there were uh, these 
important effect um, of maternal licking of their babies on uh, gene expression. Um, so we started uh, with Moise Schiff looking at the role of DNA methylation um, and chronic physical aggression. So we had um, all these uh, children that were well studied from uh, in terms of physical aggression. Uh, and so we did epigenetic work on them. Um, and the first work uh, that was done by Nadine Provençal showed that there was, were 448 distinct gene promoters who were differentially methylated when we compared uh, the adults who had a history of physical aggression and those who did not have a history of physical aggression. Uh, that was for the males. And um, we had similar differences uh, for the adult females. Um, using PET measures of brain serotonin synthesis, we found that adult males with chronic physical aggression had lower in vivo serotonin synthesis in the orbitofrontal cortex. And we then showed that serotonin synthesis in the left and right orbitofrontal cortex was also associated with DNA methylation level in T cells and monocytes. Um, the, we did the, um, an epigenetic uh, study with incarcerated um, males, and uh, we showed that the mean methylation uh, for the 1.48 KB region of MAOA promoter assessed by epitiper, uh, the results indicated significant hypermethylation among ASPD case the ASPD case group compared to the healthy controls. And um, <clears throat> Charlotte uh, Cecile in London um, conducted an environmental risk oxytoxin receptor gene methylation and youth callous unemotional traits with 13 year olds with the ALSPAC um, study. And they showed that higher maternal psychopathology, criminal behavior, substance use associated with higher oxytocin receptor gene methylation at birth. Um, and the levels were more stable from birth to 13 years of age. Uh, <clears throat> for those that had uh, CU traits. Um, <clears throat> my uh, perspective on, on this work is that the intergenerational transmission um, from genetics and environment is important um, and, and um, Jan Steen in the Netherlands um, created this picture uh, to um, remind us that the way you hear it is the way you sing it in terms of there, is, there are important family influences. Um, so uh, <clears throat> when we look at the early predictors of physical aggression during early childhood and we look at the family characteristics, we see that there are numerous characteristics in the families that are related to uh, physical aggression. And the way that I've been 
illustrating this is with Hydra. Um, the Hydra, if we want to solve the problem, um, there are many heads to cut. Um, and, and so if we take the person, what are the family characteristics that are most highly correlated with chronic physical aggression in children? If we start by the bottom, poor marital relationships, teenage pregnancy, maternal low education, poverty, maternal anger, maternal depression, maternal stress, maternal antisocial behavior, and maternal smoking. Um, a lot of maternal uh, indicators. Um, and if uh, we look at mating, um, th this work um, in Sweden shows that non-random non mating is evident in psychiatric populations, both within specific disorders and across the spectrum of psychiatric conditions. This phenomenon may hold important implications for how we understand the family transmission of these disorders. Um, <clears throat> so the problems in the families that are associated with the problems uh, children have um, is based partly on genetics, partly on environment, but both genetic and environments are family characteristics. So partner selection, assortative mating is important in to understand that story. And the challenge, uh, the Hydra challenge is that we need to address all of these problems. If we try to find one of the problems that will solve the problem, it's very rare uh, that we can do that. Um, so let's take this intergenerational continuum of adversity, of adverse environment perspective. On the left, we have assortative mating for low self-control, school failure, depression, tobacco use and abuse, delinquency, early sex, partner abuse. During pregnancy, we have gene expression and brain development and after birth, we can see uh, <clears throat> the problems that start to appear. Um, a very good example of where we should start um, is the long-term effects of prenatal and infant infancy nurse home visitation. Uh, David Olds and his team have been doing randomized controlled trials um, with pregnant women um, who have a history of uh, problem uh, behavior. They are young um, women with a lot of the indications that I have just shown. Uh, and <clears throat> the intervention from uh, the prenatal period up to two years of age are showing that there are very long-term effects on the children, um, but the effects 
are more important for the baby girls than for the baby boys. Um, so this is a suggestion um, that we need, although the baby girls appear to be less disruptive, um, those who are disruptive are more at risk and they are to a certain extent easier uh, to help. There's also evidence of DNA methylation, impact on DNA methylation of these intervention. <clears throat> um, in 1951, Lucien Beauvais, a psychiatrist uh, from uh, Geneva was asked by the mental health, uh, the World Health Organization, the mental health part, uh, to do a review of what could be done to prevent juvenile delinquency. And in his review of the literature, he concluded Chronic diseases are not an, uh, oh, sorry, that, that's, I'm missing the, I'm missing the slide um, from Lucien Beauvais, but he um, concluded that we needed to focus much more on helping girls um, that have problem behaviors than males because they are the ones who are becoming the mothers. And if we help them, we will help the next uh, generation. David Barker, um, a public health expert in Great Britain, um, concluded the same in the same way by looking at physical, uh, chronic physical diseases. Chronic diseases are not the inevitable lot of humankind. We could readily prevent them had we the will to do so. Many babies in the womb in the Western world today are receiving unbalanced and inadequate diets. Protecting the nutrition and health of girls and young women should be the cornerstone of public health. Not only will this prevent chronic disease but it will produce new generations who have better health and well-being through their lives. Um, <clears throat> so assertive mating needs to be taken into account. Pregnancy needs to be taken into account and gene expression needs to be taken up into account if we want to prevent these behavior problems. And um, one person who summarized this very clearly is the chief of the Soli people in Zambia. She concluded, when you educate a man, an individual is educated. When you educate a woman, you educate her children and thus the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's tricky to do claps, but anyone wants to unmute themselves. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Um, right, I will um, look out for questions. I have a few, but um, I will put it open. Can any, has anyone got a question? Could you speak out? Because it's hard hard to see you all at once because there's so many people. Otherwise, I will start with my question. I, I had a question. Hey, Emma, go ahead. Hi there. Thanks for a lovely talk. Um, I just had a question about the epigenetic research that you showed. Um, and I just wasn't sure the initially when you showed, it looked like you'd done an epigenome-wide scan to look for differences in DNA methylation. And I just wasn't sure what how um, the coverage of that scan so if that was on one of the more modern kind of epic arrays and what tissue you'd used and just 
it was shown quite quickly. I was just adding. Yeah, a few we 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 did this. Uh, it's almost ten years ago. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, it, when we, when we started that work, we everything was doing by hand. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> things things have evolved <laughs> since. And if, as, I mean, I don't know about I don't know about um, epigenetic research on on aggression in particular, but I I don't know if any of the big kind of consortia have done any big kind of EWAS is for, for yes. these kinds of traits at all. Yes, they were the, I don't know if the paper has come out yet. I, um, I reviewed it uh, a while back and um, it's uh, the group from, uh, well, the, the people from everywhere, but uh, Boomsma. Oh yeah. Uh, um, the, and, the main problem with that work is that the uh, <clears throat> uh, their their assessment of aggression is not very good. <laughs> so there's very good epigenetic work, yeah. uh, but it, it's it's a very general uh, assessment. Uh, uh, there's not much physical aggression. They, they've sort of mixed every indicator uh, of sort of aggression, but it, it's not the worst kinds of aggression yeah it's all it's the problem isn't it for doing yes. yeah these well-powered studies okay and, and just out of interest do the kind of the, the genes that are typically so that so the the genes that have been associated through the animal work through michael Meany's work and yes. MA, do they come up again in these big studies yes uh, well <laughs> no not in in the big studies um uh, I I I I don't remember. I um, yeah, no, I. I yeah, I, I'm not familiar with. It. I was just right. yeah. <laughs> curious. You, you you can yeah. Uh, you have a look. There is a. It's probably come out now. The, the booms must study. You can check that out. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Great. Thank you, Emma. Anyone else have some questions? Okay, well, I'll dive in with one while people think of them. Um, thank you for your talk, uh, Professor Tremblay. So um, I was thinking about the, your feet, the, the, the big sex difference that you've had to handle all, 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 your, all your life in terms of this, the phenotype of aggression yes. and the higher rates in, in, in males. And um, I was making, in my mind, making parallels with work we've done on autism and ADHD, where the, the, both of those are more common in boys. And um, we came up with this hypothesis called the female protective effect, which is that for females to have um, autism or ADHD, they need to have inherited a, a higher risk load to demonstrate the same level of symptoms as boys. Hence, you get fewer girls with those conditions because there's something about being a female that is protective and therefore you need sort of more of the risk factors to push the person you know, on a sort of liability scale yes. into the sort of affected range. And I wondered if that um, idea has ever reached the aggression literature or if there are other unique theories about where the sex difference comes from. And I'm sorry if I missed a key part of that in your talk. My, my son, who isn't aggressive, thankfully, came in <laughs> in the early stages of the talk, so I, I did miss a few slides at the start. Um, I, I think that there, I, I didn't know that there, there was this difference in, in autism. Um, and it's it's very clear in aggression, and the mechanism could be the same. Um, I don't know that anyone has has looked at it has looked at it from that perspective. Um, but. Um, it, uh, it it's interesting that that you asked that paper, question. A paper for someone out, out there to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, but it, it, it reminds me that we, we have been working on the sex differences in in school success uh, recently, 
uh, and you have this the same situation if if you look at girls today are clearly much more successful than boys in academics um, now that we've let girls uh, be part of be well educated uh, and um, be uh, implicated in careers uh, there is this big problem and I, I think it's worldwide in terms of the, the, there's more girls than males that are successful in uh, in the university courses um, and in trying to review that literature it sort of comes out uh, relatively clearly that that girls are sort of made in such a way that they are less handicapped um, by the environment. And, and I guess you have been doing twin studies, haven't you? Um, has there been twin studies on um, uh, autism? Uh, yes, yeah, lots of them. Yeah. And, and, and so, you can see the difference between the males and the females? Yeah, no, that's the interesting thing. You don't get very, you don't get significant heritability differences between males and females. Um, so it doesn't look like it's, it's not as simple as that. The same, I mean, there are probably a variety of explanations perhaps um, playing a role, but I just wondered about whether the female protective effect had been looked at in relation to aggression. Um, yeah. Anyway, well, it has you. it hasn't been looked at from the perspective that, that you're saying. Mm -hmm. And um, just the other point I thought I'd make was that you raised the you know you quoted about um, if you if mothers are okay then children are okay because mothers are all looking after their you know young children, yeah. and it's such a fascinating uh, situation we are in now. And obviously Ted knows all about this. Is the huge changes in the the early years for children over the last few decades where you know the the in, at least in the UK the Office of National Statistics data you know shows us that two-thirds of mothers with under five-year-olds now work so the environment of these young children has changed massively since when you're talking about say you know 1960s or 70s where the majority of mothers were the ones looking after those young children um, so there's the, the presumably is some quite interesting work to do if you looked at kind of cross cohort or cross generational data in terms of the environments that young children are in. Um, just alluding to that comment you made at the end about uh, mothers raising their young children and, and how that's changed so much in the last few decades. Yes, the problem is that the mothers that are higher risk of having children that will have problems are the ones who stay at home with their children. Um, so when you look at the daycare st studies on, on daycare, um, <clears throat> the uh, children in daycare tend to be children from relatively successful mothers who are working, while as the mothers that have uh, important problems are still at home with their children uh, mm -hmm. and the children should be in daycare and we're, we're doing exper uh, experiments uh, with daycare and the challenge is to get these mothers to send their children to daycare so that they will have a better environment. Mm, that's fascinating. Um, okay, I don't want to take up all the time. We've got two minutes left, or we don't have to be that strict, but does anyone else have any questions? Please speak out. No, I can't see any hands raising. I feel like I'm still getting used to the whole spotting a question online. Okay, well, I think it's just time Hello. for us then. Yeah, oh yeah, okay, speak out. Jacqueline, was... Jacqueline Barnes yeah. here. Lovely it's to great. see you again, Richard. <laughs> Um, I wonder, I was interested in your slide about the family nurse partnership and I wondered if you'd had an impact on recommending that it was much more 
useful for um, mothers with daughters and mothers with sons? If I have been successful? Have you given advice to them and has it, yes, has it worked? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I was with David Old uh, last, last year. Um, we, we, we didn't really speak about that. <laughs> he doesn't want to know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, <laughs> they, they, they are very successful. So ch changing uh, uh, their, their uh, way of doing things would not be easy. <laughs> I can imagine, yes, thank you. Great nice time. seeing you, very nice <laughs> seeing you. I can see Ted has a question or has raised his hand anyway. Um, just following up, hello, Risha. It's Ted Miller. Oh, hi, Ted. Hi. Following up from uh, Jacqueline's question about the family nurse partnership, as well as the differences in aggression in uh, boys and girls, you also get differences in language development in boys and girls. And yes. um, the recent analysis of the family nurse partnership in the UK indicates, if anything, that uh, the Family Nurse Partnership has some benefits for language outcomes. That again would suggest that the Family Nurse Partnership might well be most productive with boys than with girls. And therefore, you know, an analysis of those kinds of interventions and on the, you know, in terms of the differential effects of interventions by yes. gender might be particularly fruitful. Yes. Well, the, the, the last uh, publications that I remember, they were showing that the girls were more successful than the boys. Yeah. That's it. I mean, it's, it's interesting in the sense that on the basis of what you know about the outcomes, there looks like far more room for improvement in the boys and the girls. Yes. Yet it's the girls who are showing the bigger effect. It's actually almost counterintuitive. Well, they are more responsive. Sure. Yeah. 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 And they, That's they another will, way of looking at it. <laughs> yeah. And they, I mean, from a long term perspective, they will be, uh, they will be the mothers of the next generation. Um, Absolutely. So that, in that sense, that makes that's where you get your double whammy. Yeah, that's, that, that's my point. Uh, that yes. uh, in terms of prevention, uh, we, we need to take care of the girls uh, uh -huh. so that in the long run they will help the boys. If we focus, <laughs> if we put our resources on the males, I mean it it will. It will just stop. Uh, no, but you're, you're, you're faced with this dilemma of one needs some short term effects as well, as well as yes. the longer term effects which you're talking about. Yes, yeah. sure. Yeah, so yeah. more resources are needed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, any final questions? I think we're slightly over. I can't see anyone. No, no. Oh, Olga, do you have a question? Um, yeah, sorry, I was a bit late, but maybe I missed this. Um, what are the paternal effects if uh, a father is the primary caregiver? Are there any effects on aggression um, when the dad is the primary caregiver in a family? Yeah, unfortunately, we, uh, we did not study that because we, uh, we don't have an, a uh, large sample enough. The, the sample is not large enough to uh, study. That's it's relatively rare. Uh, at least it was relatively rare in uh, the samples that we had. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, but it's it's a very good question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay, I think I'll, we should wrap it up there so people aren't late for their next um, 
commitments, but let's just thank uh, Richard. Sorry, I didn't know how to pronounce your name before I heard other people saying it. Um, <laughs> thank you again for a very interesting talk. Thank you for your time and uh, sharing all that with us. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All the best. Bye.